From the Lean Enterprise Institute in Boston, this is the WLEI Podcast, where we share stories of people making the world better through lean thinking and practice. For more information about LEI, including how we can help you apply lean thinking, please visit lean.org. Lean veteran Billy Taylor coaches others in what he calls the winning link. His new book, which is titled, no surprise, The Winning Link, a proven process to define, align, and execute strategy at every level from McGraw-Hill, shares what he calls a connected operating system, helping people and organizations define and achieve a set of ambitious goals. Billy learned and developed this approach through decades of success at Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Welcome to WLEI, the podcast of the Lean Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Tom Ehrenfeld, and I'm delighted to discuss with Billy how to cultivate what he calls extreme leadership as a means of building a cohesive and top-tier organization. Welcome to WLAI, the podcast of the Lean Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Tom Ehrenfeld. Today, we have the uh, great privilege of speaking with Billy Taylor, author of a new book, The Winning Link. Hey, Billy, how are you? Hey, how are you doing today? And thank you for having me. Ah, It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So Billy's book, The Winning Link, um, shares something called the Open Excel Mm -hmm. system, which is a kind of comprehensive management system that Billy's developed over several decades of working primarily at Goodyear, implementing operational excellence. And it has a kind of number of integrated elements about um, clarity, purpose, setting goals, coaching people in a mindful way that they know why they're executing and that ultimately the system becomes improvable and renewable, cultivation. And he speaks to all those aspects in this book. Um, So I think the best way to start, however, is having given a brief praises myself. Billy, tell us uh, what's at the heart of this book. Well, what is a connected operating model? And when I say connected, it's not just about the tools, right? We've heard people process tools, but how do you link those together so they form as an ecosystem? They're interdependent upon each other. Uh, that's what's different, right? How do you connect functions and tiers? Right? Often we're talking about strategy deployment, but that 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 strategy normally stops in someone's computer or it's on a wall, right? We did the strategy, we send it out to people, but we really don't deploy it to, to exactly who owns what in that strategy. And then therefore, we, we've heard people talk about the hidden factory. We've heard people talking about, well, what, what we talk about is, you can't manage a secret. So what's hidden is not only the factory, what's hidden is your strategy. What's hidden is who owns what in that strategy. And in the link, that, in the link, uh, the winning link, we talk about how do you connect those, those people, processes, right, and tools at each function and every tier of the organization. Excellent. You can't manage a secret. The um, Is something you talk about frequently in the book and in different contexts. It it says to me, kind of the converse is that it's not just you can't manage a secret, it's that there's a very clear and essential need always for those who are leading to help every person clarify mm-hmm. what they're not, that they should start with an understanding of purpose and then mm-hmm. understand strategy as a series of goals Um, to realize that purpose. And furthermore, as managers provide a sense of ownership is something you talk about as a means of clarifying and making explicit what people are seeking to achieve Mm -hmm. and how they're going to do it. And I I think that's at the heart of strategy deployment, but you seem to be about demystifying the daily management system of enabling people to collectively hit these goals. Absolutely. And, and, and it starts with the value proposition. 
as human beings, that's what we seek most to, fe to feel and, and be valued, even in our relationships. And so as leaders start to, to deploy strategy or connect strategy, it's that ownership piece that's often missing. See, ownership trumps accountability, right? And, and when people own it, I always say in the absence of ownership comes blame, right? When people don't know what they own, they tend to blame when things go wrong. Well, let me put a little, little, little color around the uh, ownership trumps accountability. If okay. you've ever rented a car or stayed in a hotel, I am accountable for that car, but I'll eat a, a, a hamburger in that car in a minute. I'll do things in that car that I probably wouldn't do in the car I own. Uh, if I'm staying at a hotel, uh, you know, I may put my shoe on and, and tie my shoe on that leather ottoman, but I wouldn't do that on Miss Rachel's ottoman in my house. Right? And the difference is ownership. When people tend to feel they own it, you get the higher level of engagement. Okay. I'm you draw a lot from experience in the book. You talk about the successes at this uh, Fayetteville plant and other other plants. What, how, tell me how you learned from experience, say, these lessons about the difference between ownership and accountability. Well, moving into to, to different organizations, uh, I actually uh, managed six different locations and these locations across North America uh, were problematic in some form or another. And so going into these organizations, it was bigger than the leader itself, right? You, when you're talking about evangelizing your process, evangelizing it. And so when I went into these organizations, I would start in meetings and hold these big town halls. And, and, and I thought I was being deliberately clear on what the strategy was, deliberately clear on what true North was. But what I didn't have was that alignment and ownership from the people? See, okay. and, and when I when I started to talk about real strategy deployment, defining winning, that must be confirmed. And it, it's not what you say; it's what the people hear, and, and what they embrace. And so we would have these pocket meetings of, uh, and this was a three thousand workforce plant. We'd meet with thirty people every day for lunch. And we buy their lunch, and 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 and, and I'm telling you, relentlessly, we held these meetings, these skip level lunches, and at that point, we could tell if people, one, understood where what the purpose of the organization was and what they owned in the strategy, and so it was almost like a mirror exercise, right? We were looking in the mirror of the enterprise, and the the mirror they were speaking to us. Here's what we thought was happening then here's what we, we we actually confirmed was happening. So at that point, we started building models around how do we communicate strategy? How do we connect strategy? But more importantly, how do we engage the entire workforce inside the strategy? Huh. Is having a goal of producing 38,000 tires a day in a factory a strategy? No, so, so really, that's what, what we call that a, a CPI, a critical performance indicator. If we didn't make the 38,000 tires, that plant wouldn't be in existence. So and I'm, I'm right. using an example from your book. Sorry, I'm not even absolutely context for the <laughs> listeners. No. And so, right, the purpose was to, to, right, to meet customers' demands on time and full, right, to safely meet those demands. That's what our purpose was. Uh, it was critical that we delivered 38,000 a day cost effectively so that we could improve the bottom line. But what we really realized in our strategy, we, we, we actually implemented a process called KPAs, key performance actions that deliver the KPI, right? The KPA is the actions I have to take. It's what I do. The KPI is what I get. So I often talk about if I stood on a scale in the morning, that's a KPI. The KPA is did I work out? Did I right? Did I eat in uh, two thousand calories a day? Did I sleep? And so that's the connected business model when you're talking strategy. And who should talk about the, the who should be more uh, qualified to talk about KPAs? The people closest to the source. 
So in the book, we talk about when we build the visual management boards, there's two, two parts to that. One is the KPA side, and the second is the KPI side. Often companies go right in the red greens on KPIs. So that's how we, we look at connecting strategy with, with tactical execution. Okay, fabulous. Because one of the things I enjoyed about the book is how well it brought things into focus. So it, it explained how you make real, say, ambitious goals that are defined under strategy. And it seems, um, oh gosh, there, there's a Taiichi Ono quote about Toyota production system being nothing more than a powerful application of common sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I knew exactly where you were going with that quote. Okay. And that's why. Tell me more. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we, we think about common sense, right? It's it's that that it, it, it's what's inside, right? That, that understanding, that practical understanding, and also we get caught up in a common language rather than a common meaning. See, at the core of the common sense, it's that common understanding, and what drives that, right, is a common meaning. If I get off of a plane in Brazil, everyone says, hola, right? I get off of a plane in New York, they, hi. If I get off a plane in Texas, they may say howdy, right? <laughs> the common meaning is a greeting you politely. And so that's common sense. And when I become educated in all three of those, no matter where I land, I understand. Okay. And a smile is a comfort, right? That that emotional intelligence gives me a warm gives you a warm greeting. Texas, howdy. I know what they mean. I smile. Hi. Yeah. Right. And so with the common sense with, with operational excellence and lean, how do you create that common sense approach? And that's what I focused on in the book. Uh, it was a, I think, rewrite three times. One, bouncing it off Sammy the janitor, bouncing it off. The, the CEO and vice president of an organization to build that, 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 that model in the book that was comprehensible at every level of an organization. Let's <clears throat> unpack that model. So to me, it seems like there's a sequence of kind of forming a uh, strategy that, mm -hmm. that is, that comes after getting clear on the purpose. Um, and then I don't even need my notes, but you, you create the strategy, then you communicate it, mm -hmm. then you execute it through a daily management system, which enables you over the longer term to focus on governing, which is sustaining. Um, so what steps will people take after reading your book? Should people take to make this up? Good question. Uh, one, again, simplifying, I'm making it easy. It's really clear what I, the approach I like for people to take. One, first, you must define what winning is. Be deliberately clear. After you've done that, then you must, go ahead. No, give me an example or two. So okay. remember in the book, it talks about the jersey with 38 on it. Yeah. That was a symbol, but defining winning, I was deliberately clear on what we needed to accomplish to survive. And I communicated that to the people and I was deliberately clear on what the strategy was, meeting 30 people a day to get that, that back and forth interaction and confirming that they understood where, where we're going. So defining winning is being deliberately clear of what we wanted to achieve or needed to achieve and what the strategy was. So being deliberately clear. After we, were, we, 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 we knew we'd made significant strides in deliberate clarity, the second step is aligning to win. So once you know what winning is, I think alignment is critical so people know what they own in the strategy. They know how they impact winning, right? And so if, if Billy Taylor needed a thousand tires a day, that's the enterprise goal. But I've got, let's just say, I've got 10 tire machines. 
where everyone on those tire machines understands that they have to make a hundred tires a day. And so being deliberate and clear around what everyone owned so that we could celebrate, right? Celebrate the win. And, and when I say aligning the win, that's not only what the target is, the processes to get there and the people that are going to drive it. And at that point, I can be hard on the process and lead easy on the people. Right, right. Right? And so the next phase, after I define winning, a, a, a deliberate ownership, being very deliberate around who owns what in the strategy and how they impact it, and also being very deliberate on recognizing and embracing those processes and people that are driving results. Tell me more, uh, like, do you have examples or stories around that challenge? Yes, absolutely. Uh, when, we, when we started to walk, uh, um, just think of uh, I, I, the example I remember very, very, very clearly, not vividly, uh, was in Fayetteville. Um, tire builders, they checked their brains at the gate. They didn't understand how they impacted winning. And so when we started this process, where well, we could walk around and at a glance, people could see how we were winning as a team and how they were impacting it as an individual. And so that alignment was very clear. But now let's talk about if this was a football game, American football game. We were very clear around what the CPI was. So just think about if you go to a football game and there's one minute left on the clock, it's in the fourth quarter, first down, and so you have to formulate a strategy. But there's no score on each team. That part of the scoreboard just went blank. So now what's your strategy, right? You've got the ball, it's on the 20-yard line. What are you gonna do? Well, what you're gonna say is that it depends on what? The CPI, right? If I'm up 40, 40 to zero, I'm gonna run the clock out. I'm gonna, uh, that's the strategy. If I'm down three and I'm on a 20 yard line, my strategy now is to score a touchdown, not to kick a field goal for three points. I need seven to win the game. So being deliberately clear on what winning is and what we have to do. That's an example that I would use. And I, I often used to use with, in meetings. Okay. And so when, when, we, when we talk about that deliberate ownership, Again, let's go back to the value proposition. When I acknowledge the fact that you're doing something and contributing to help the organization, you engage more. Relationships, my wife and I, right? I can't have a type of relationship with my wife and say, oh, I love you today. If anything changes, I'll let you know. That doesn't work in my household, right? <laughs> I have to be repeatable around the value proposition. It's the same with people. I, you know, I have this saying, if you make people visible, they will make you valuable. Okay. When I speak to Sammy, the janitor, and Sammy would come into my office, Sammy became my, my most impactful mentor. He would tell me, Billy, you're, you're in these skip level meetings but people don't understand that business jargon you're speaking. You've got to simplify it. Break that down. Don't come in the meeting talking about waste as a percent to finish stock value. Don't come in and talk about percent of sales. Let's just say we have scrap and we lost this, this much money and it impacts the bottom line. Speak the language of the natives. And so that alignment tool is, is helping you, again, be deliberate, deliberately clear. Interesting. Two thoughts. One, uh, a great element of your book is the way you provide charts um, comparing jargon with straight talk, common language. I think you do that really well. Um, and another, just hearing you talk about Sammy the janitor, um, is that your book emphasizes the principle of respect for people throughout and it, it's not a main explicit theme. And yet it seems just stuffed with practices that 
kind of embody this respect for people. So engaging them in clarifying the numbers, um, providing us a sense of ownership. And the question is, where does that fit into your kind of priority list as a, a manager or just coach? <laughs> Top of the list. It, it, this is where I start. Um, you know, earlier in my career, uh, this is even being a minority uh, executive, you know, I wanted to be liked. Mm -hmm. And I would do things to be liked. And and and, and those that, that created it, created setbacks for me Interesting. when i started to talk about respect and trust see leadership is not a color leadership is not a race it's not a gender right it's what you do it's how you treat others it's about respect and trust interesting if, you know if you and i were in let's just say russia or wherever or, which would be a foreign country and and i see you in a restaurant and i hear you speaking english I'm going to migrate over to you, right? It's no longer about black, white anymore, right? It's around respect for something that I think is valued by both of us, right? The fact that we can communicate. And so um, I used to do things earlier in my career um, to, to, to be liked, and that didn't help me. <laughs> and then I realized I'd rather be respected and trusted than liked. And when people respect you and trust you, right, that's when change really happens and people will follow you as a leader. And the leader has to be a good follower. All right. And that's what I talk about in the book. I worked for my team. They didn't work for me. Okay. I It was my job to eliminate barriers and constraints. It was my job, right, to, to, to help them drive change through enabling them through my actions. My favorite question, as a matter of fact, it was my favorite question. It was the most hated question by people that work for me. And leaders that I work with now use this. And 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 I would I would often ask, what do you need from me? Okay. Not what do you want from me, right? What do you need from me to 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 drive the change that I'm asking you to make? Now, there's a difference between want and need. Okay, I want a Bentley. I need a ride to work. Okay, they're different. And leaders have to be very, very specific around the difference of those two. After I give you the support and the, and the, and the things you need to enable you, now it's about what's your standard, that leadership standard, right? And then I'd often ask, so why do you accept that? Why do you accept that? You know, okay. and so, you know, and, and one of the things that I'd say is what you accept, you can't change. You know, organizations and leaders fail is because whatever you walk by, that's the standard. Whatever you walk by is the standard. And so leaders say, well, we've got a standard policy around safety, PPE. We have a standard around this, but then you walk by someone not wearing their personal protective equipment. You have lines on your floors that says walk between these lines so don't get in the middle of the aisle, but you walk by people walking down the middle of the aisle. That's a new standard. What Whatever you the, accept. What is the message that you take away when you see standards not being followed? Chaos. Okay. Cha a chaotic organization. Right. What makes our uh, I say America great is its governance model. Right. And so what I mean by that, people believe if they go down a highway, the speed limit is 55, they can go 60. They believe they've got a five, five, right, five mile cushion. However, if we ride by uh, a police car that's parked on the bridge, no one has even been in the automobile. We automatically take our foot off the off the gas instinctively. Why? We know the standard. We elect to not follow the standard. And but when there's consequences, everything flows from traffic lights to don't walk into a bank and say, here's a bag, fill it up with money. Right? No, 
the governance model protects those processes and those are driven by standards. Now, standards are not monuments, right? They, they change, but you have to earn the right to change. And I think that standards that are set by the people who are doing the work become the um, kind of baseline for improvement. Absolutely. You hit, as they say down south, you hit the nail on the head, right? There, when, when you said that, that is the base for improvement, right? That repetition, that, 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 here's the, the, the baseline for how you do it. And, and, and again, when leaders walk by people not following the standard, that is the best practice that have been confirmed. Then you're setting yourself and your team and that individual up for failure. How would you intervene in a situation like that? What would you do? So what, what I would often do, I didn't walk by it. Again, once earlier in my career, I walked by a gentleman that was doing something wrong and it stuck in my crawl because I felt that that person was in harm's way. Uh, and it was it was serious injury or fatality could have happened to that person. And had he got hurt, the company and I probably would have been in court. But all I had to do is go over there and go in there, saw with, saw with why I'm talking to you, and go back to the standard. That's non-negotiable. And often those standards are approved when you walk in the door as an employee or when if, if you're a union environment, those things are negotiated and, and, and built into right a contract. So I would approach that, you know, not non-confrontational because psychological safety is important. Right? Even when you're managing visual management boards, I often say celebrate the red. Yeah. Celebrate the red so you can harvest the green. Right. Because if people if people don't bring issues to you, then those issues are a secret. And remember, you can't manage a secret. And so how do you create that and foster that environment that that people feel comfortable bringing those things to you? Yeah. And so I I actually, you know, I go into people and there's a section in the book that talks about the ugly baby. And I don't mean that literally, but what I'm saying is in business, there are some things that are uncomfortable to talk about, but you can't skirt them. And, and, and so I would approach, I would not go directly to people, however. I follow the chain of command. Because if I went to you and there's someone else there, then when I'm not around, you're going to continue to violate the standard. And the standard is the standard. Right. Okay. Um, um, so you actually interesting. You mentioned race in the book. You say that you were the actually first uh, black person to work at the Goodyear plant in Kingman, Arizona. Yes. And I wonder, you know, the best that I, a an older white guy, can ask this question uh, sensitively. Um, you know, how did that play a factor? Which it sounds like it it informed your thinking early in your career when you wanted to be liked, maybe felt you had something to prove, but perhaps evolved over time. Well, what that really taught me, going back to what we talked about, respect and trust. I, when I walked into that building, I was fully aware that there are 0.7% Blacks in the whole community. Mm-hmm. And so at that point, um, it was more so what's my value proposition, not what's my race. And you know what, to, to win a team over, I was new to them just as much as, you know, they were new to me. And so I spent an enormous amount of efforts building trust, building relationship. So again, I would meet with those individuals, right? And so my, what was interesting around that story and, and rest his soul today, but when I first went there, I was told by my predecessor and some others that I was going to have a problem out of a specific person, and uh, for various reasons. Um, long story short, he became my greatest asset on the leadership team. Um, he did. He was very standoffish at first. I repeatedly 
I met with him, met with his team, uh, did coaching, made myself available for him, but held him accountable to the things that he owned. And I never, what I never forget, he came in, he called timeout. He, he says, timeout. And he goes, one, I hate coming into this office. And that question you always ask, what do you need from me? He says, Billy, I couldn't answer it anymore. But when you walk me out, once you gave me what I needed, you'd walk me around and see people sitting down, uh, taking excessive breaks, not wearing their personal protective equipment. And you'd ask me, why do you accept that? Why do you accept that? Wow, Billy, I don't know. And I'd often say, well, what do you accept? You can't change. And what you walk by is the standard. And I says, how can you write anyone up for not following standards when you're evasive on what the standard is? <laughs> and so he, he came back to me and then he would park, he'd come see me every single day. That relationship came and I'll never forget, he invited me to his home and we were gonna make sausage, I think it was. He was showing me, he, he loved to cook. And then I remember I got ready to leave and I was getting ready to get promoted. And it was the greatest, one of the greatest testimonies of trust and respect I ever had. I, I said, hey, I wanna let you know I'm leaving and I'm gonna you know, recommend you for the job. He goes, no, I don't wanna do it. He says, but I don't want you to leave. And he starts crying. <laughs> and he says, you know, can I, I want to say this. The person that replaces you won't have big uh, shoes to fill. They'll have big hearts to fill. He says, the way you made me and us feel as a leadership team, we knew we we're a part of the process. We were, uh, right, we were evangelists of what Billy Taylor was bringing because Billy Taylor had our, our best interests at heart. And so when I, when, when I look at that piece of executing winning, we talked about defining, aligning, but executing, it's beyond the tools. Although the visual management system is, is important, it's critical, the operating system is important, but that aspect of trust in building that culture, because our culture controls strategy. Mm -hmm. If you have a culture where people are not bought in, and they're not bought into you, you know, those things, those things impact the bottom line. You know, I, I, I use sports analogies quite often, uh, but I, I love watching Nick Saban. I'm not an Alabama fan, but I love Nick Saban style or Bill Belichick, right? Uh, I look at some of those best coaches, even what Deion Sanders is doing at Jackson State. And why are kids wanting to go leave powerhouse universities and go play for Jackson State? It's the culture that he's creating, the value system that he's creating. Now, here's what I say about Nick Saban. Nick Saban can take a kid from the worst environment or worst neighborhood in America and take a kid from the best neighborhoods. Right? He can go to Martha's Vineyard and get an athlete. But yep. on game day, you can't tell what kids from where. Why? Because it's the Alabama standard. No, I he totally, totally agree. I, I admire Alabama enormously. I, I, I actually follow them. They're <laughs> just incredibly well coached. And it's Absolutely. Just... And, 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 and year after year, that standards keep them at the top of the polls. That standard. Right. And everybody wants a, a, a former Nick Saban coach. Everybody. Right. And so, again, and, but just, just talk about the, the, you know, building that respect and trust. Those kids respect and trust him as a leader. Those parents respect and trust him. A hundred percent of the players don't go to the league. But it's but um, it's a trust that is you can't produce trust by saying, I trust you or trust Absolutely. me. It's, it's formed indirectly through the creation of a system of commitments and shared, I guess, ownership, something Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and again, like you said, shared ownership, that value that I am a part of something. I know what I own 
inside this enterprise. And I know how I contribute and I'm valued for doing so. And I'm valued for doing so. You know, I, I, when, when I interact, even on social media, I get direct comments from people that I've worked with in both union and union free organizations. You know, Billy, when Billy was here, he'd come in on third shift before there was undercover boss. Right? I remember coming in one night in one of my facilities in Topeka, Kansas. And I heard some things that was going on. So I, I, I drove into Walmart, bought me a, a shirt and some jeans, took the suit off, grabbed me a baseball cap. I went in on third shift and just hung out. And really, the people were doing what they were supposed to do. There were a couple I saw sleeping. But I went and talked to them. And then at about 6 a.m., I called the plant manager. And I says, hi, I'm, I'm in your plant. I've been here since 3 a.m. And I just want to congratulate you on a job well done. Your, your, your team, uh, they're engaged. They own it. Your supervisors are. And he goes, you're in my plant? You've been here all night? I said, yeah, but they wouldn't recognize this selfie, right? And so right, it's that piece of, again, what are people doing when, when, when no one's looking? That's also important, right? Yeah. At 2 a.m., 3 a.m., you know, I wasn't surprised. And this, I didn't show up because it was a poor running organization. I showed up because it was one of my best running organizations. And I wanted to know why they were so good. So that's a different mindset. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you for having me. And I've been a fan of LEI for years as I've come through the organization. So I was honored that you even invited me to be on the show. Ah, so thank you. It's nothing. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, bye-bye. Bye. What a great chat with Billy Taylor, a wise and experienced coach. I want to thank him for joining us on this episode of WLAI and for sharing a wealth of insights and humanity about leading others. I also want to thank John Cotter and Lori Moniz of LAI for their help producing this podcast. And above all, thank you, dear listener, for joining us.